If you're currently in a second semester introductory chemistry course, I want you to think back to the moment when you first learned about the solubility rules and precipitation reactions. Way back in those old days, you learned to look for insoluble salts in the list of solubility rules related to the ions that are mixed in a particular mixing of two ionic aqueous solutions in order to predict whether a precipitate would form or not. If a combination of ions produced an insoluble salt, of course, a precipitate would form. In the language and through the lens of chemical equilibrium, this is kind of like assuming that insoluble salt has a KSP of zero and comparing a QSP that is greater than zero necessarily, right, by definition, since this is a product of con concentrations, to that zero KSP for the insoluble salt and drawing the conclusion that precipitation would occur. Now that we understand that solubility is a continuum, we can recognize that for any ionic salt, there are certain conditions under which a precipitate will not form and certain conditions under which a precipitate will form depending on the relative values of QSP and KSP. And in this video, we're going to really apply an idea we've seen before in comparing Q and K to determine the direction that a reaction system will take when it's under a non-equilibrium situation to the specific context of solubility equilibria, learning to predict whether a precipitate will form or not given the concentrations of the ions involved. And we'll also be able to solve related problems where, for example, we might know a KSP and the concentration of one ion and we want to figure out how much of the other ion does it take to precipitate out the ion that we know. This is another type of problem that you can solve essentially by comparing Q to K and solving for the unknown variable there. All right, so to get into this, I want to look at a particular example, the dissolution of calcium carbonate, CaCO3. And this is a salt with a pretty small KSP value of 8.7 times 10 to the negative ninth. And this has the typical form of KSP with the product of Ca2 plus concentration and CO3 2 minus concentration at equilibrium. Now let's consider a solution we prepared by mixing two aqueous solutions of calcium 2 plus in one beaker, let's say, and CO3 2 minus in the other beaker with spectator counter ions, of course, to keep things neutral, such that when we mix the two solutions, at the instant we mix before the dissolution precipitation equilibrium has been turned on, the reaction quotient is equal to what we'll call QSP. And we've called this previously an ion product. It is the value of the concentration of Ca2 plus times the concentration of CO3 2 minus, not necessarily at equilibrium, but at this non-equilibrium point before we turn on the dissolution and precipitation reactions. At this point, we can compare this QSP value to the KSP value to determine whether a precipitate will form upon mixing or not. So for example, if we find that QSP is greater than KSP, well in this case, there are too high of concentrations of the ions relative to the equilibrium situation. To go to equilibrium, some of those ions need to come out of solution in the form of a solid, and so precipitation will occur in that case. When QSP is less than KSP, well this is a situation conceptually where we haven't reached the saturation limit. The concentrations of Ca2 plus and CO3 2 minus are small enough in a collective sense such that QSP is less than KSP that we could add more calcium ion or more carbonate ion and still not hit QSP equal to KSP. And so no precipitate will form since precipitation would lower the value of QSP, but QSP is already smaller than KSP. Precipitation cannot increase the value of QSP. And so no precipitate will form when the ion product is less than the solubility product KSP. Now something you'll want to watch out for as you're working problems related to this is the idea of dilution. We start with two solutions and mix them together the concentrations in the mixed solution will be quite a bit smaller than the original concentrations in the unmixed or separated solutions, right? So you've got to watch out for dilution and use and think about C1V1 equals C2V2 for all solutes when we're taking two solutions of ionic salts 
and mixing them together. That's going to be highly relevant as we work practice problems the remainder of this video. In this practice problem, we're asked, does silver chloride precipitate when equal volumes of a solution of silver nitrate and sodium chloride are mixed? And we're given the KSP value for AgCl. So first, let's draw a picture and lay down the relevant variables to get a sense of what we know and what we're trying to find. So we've got a solution of silver nitrate with a concentration of 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter, and it's at a volume V. We actually don't know its volume, but we do know that equal volumes of the silver nitrate and sodium chloride solutions are mixed. So I'm going to call that volume V and use that same letter to refer to the volume of the sodium chloride solution, which also has a concentration of 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. So we're taking these two solutions and we're mixing them together to produce a final solution with a total volume of 2 times V, assuming that the volumes are additive. And the question here is, will a precipitate of silver chloride form? We need to compare QSP to KSP in order to do this, and to arrive at QSP, we need a sense of the form of the reaction quotient for the dissolution precipitation equilibrium. So the next step, then, is writing the dissolution chemical equation for silver chloride. One mole of silver chloride solid on the left, one mole of silver plus cations on the right, and one mole of chloride minus anions on the right as well. This is the dissolution precipitation equilibrium equation. So now we need to determine the concentrations of Ag plus and Cl minus in this mixed solution and the value of QSP so that we can compare it to KSP. So let's do that. And the next step is just a little bit of solution stoichiometry. For the silver plus cation, we started with the solution that is 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. And we took that and diluted it essentially in a 1 to 2 dilution, doubling the volume of the solution while leaving the moles of Ag plus the same. And so the final concentration after this 1 to 2 dilution is 1 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. We essentially cut the concentration in half by doubling the volume of this solution. Similar idea is in play for the chloride. We started with 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter, took that solution and doubled its volume, leaving the moles of chloride constant, and so the final concentration of chloride after that dilution is 1 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. At this point, with these concentrations known, we can calculate the value of QSP by multiplying the silver plus concentration times the Cl minus concentration, and notice that the form of this reaction quotient just follows from the dissolution precipitation equation that we wrote earlier. Now the question is, is this value of QSP greater than or less than KSP? Well, KSP is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10th, QSP is 10 to the negative 8th, and so QSP is greater than KSP, and yes indeed, silver chloride will precipitate when these two solutions are mixed. So if we turn on that dissolution precipitation equilibrium, precipitate will form until QSP is lowered to the value of KSP. This rather meaty looking problem is about calcium oxalate in blood. It says that blood will not clot if calcium ions are removed from plasma. Some blood collection tubes contain salts of the oxalate ion for this purpose, to minimize clotting of blood when it's in storage, for example. And at sufficiently high concentrations, calcium and oxalate combine to form a precipitate solid calcium oxalate, CaC2O4.H2O. Let's imagine that the calcium 2 plus concentration in the sample of blood serum is the value given here, 2.2 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter. What we want to know is the concentration of oxalate that must be established in order to start precipitation of the calcium ion from this blood serum. At higher concentrations than this, precipitation will, of course, of course continue to, to occur. We want to know that cutoff or minimum concentration of oxalate that's needed in order to cause calcium oxalate to precipitate. And of course, we're given a KSP value for calcium oxalate, which is going to be important. All right, let's start with the dissolution chemical equation for calcium oxalate. On the left, we have the calcium oxalate, and here I've written it as the monohydrate, since that's the, the form of the compounds listed here, calcium oxalate monohydrate, so that's CaC2O4.H2O, solid on the left, and this in aqueous solution dissolves to form Ca2 plus C2O42 minus, and a molecule of H2O liquid, which we can effectively ignore. And now at this point, 
we can write the form of Ksp, the equilibrium equation, if you like. Ksp is equal to the concentration of Ca2 plus at equilibrium times the concentration of C2O4 to minus at equilibrium. And remember the mental model you want here is these concentrations are the saturation concentrations, the concentrations at which we're saturated in calcium and oxalate ions such that addition of either ion will cause precipitation. All right, well, we know Ksp, that's 1.96 times 10 to the negative eighth from the problem. We know the concentration of Ca2 plus in the blood serum, that's 2.2 times 10 to the negative three moles per liter. What we don't know and what we want to find is the corresponding concentration of oxalate such that the right-hand side equals Ksp, the ion product, if you like, is equal to Ksp. So at this point, we can just solve for this oxalate concentration by dividing both sides by the calcium ion concentration. And when we do this, we get C2O42 minus is equal to 8.9 times 10 to the negative sixth mole per liter. So this is the cutoff or minimum concentration of oxalate we need to cause calcium oxalate to precipitate out of this solution. And it's worth thinking about this a little bit more to really appreciate the relationship between QSP, KSP, and precipitation. So when C2O42 minus concentration is smaller than this value, well then the ion product is smaller than Ksp. And so no precipitation will occur when the oxalate concentration is smaller than this value, 8.9 times 10 to the negative six moles per liter. When the oxalate concentration is larger than this value, QSP is greater than Ksp and precipitation will occur. Right at the cutoff, is this value such that we're exactly at saturation, where the product of Ca2 plus concentration and oxalate concentration is equal to Ksp. In other words, QSP is equal to Ksp. This is a great problem that combines our understanding of solubility equilibria with acid-base chemistry. Clothing washed in water that has a manganese 2 plus concentration exceeding 0.1 milligrams per liter, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, may be stained upon oxidation. But we can decrease the concentration of manganese 2 plus in the water by adding a base to precipitate manganese 2 hydroxide, MnOH2. What we want to know is a pH required to keep the manganese 2 plus concentration at a particular low level, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, this 0.1 milligram per liter concentration at which staining occurs. We want to keep that manganese concentration at that level or below. And we want to know what pH of a solution is required to keep the manganese concentration that low. And we've got a Ksp value for manganese hydroxide here. So what's happening here is we want to think about per precipitating manganese hydroxide out such that the remaining concentration of Mn2 plus is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 mole moles per liter. Let's start, as we always do, by writing the dissolution chemical equation for manganese hydroxide. Here it is. And we're worried about pH, as the problem says, but really if we peel that back a little bit and think about what that really means, we're really interested in understanding the concentration of hydroxide associated with an Mn2 plus concentration of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar at equilibrium with respect to this reaction. And so we're going to proceed similar to the way we did in the last problem, writing out the equilibrium equation. Ksp is equal to the manganese 2 plus concentration at equilibrium times the hydroxide concentration squared, squared because the salt gives up two hydroxide ions upon dissolution and dissociation, both of these concentrations at equilibrium, of course, in the equilibrium equation. We know Ksp, that value is given. We know the manganese concentration we're interested in, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter manganese 2 concentration. What we want to know is the hydroxide concentration. And so here again, pretty straightforward algebra. We're going to divide both sides by that manganese 2 concentration, take the square root of both sides, and we can solve for the hydroxide concentration that way. And it comes out to 3.3 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. Now, how do we get this into pH? Well, Let's apply what we know about pH and pOH. pOH is the negative base 10 log of the hydroxide concentration. And pH is 14 minus the pOH. So pH is 14 plus the base 10 logarithm of the OH minus concentration. And this comes out to 10.5. This is kind of the key pH. This is actually the minimum pH value 
for this manganese concentration of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. If we were to add more hydroxide, raising the pH, this would result in the precipitation of even more manganese and bring that concentration of manganese below 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. On the other hand, if we used a solution with a lower pH than 10.5, well then we don't have enough hydroxide in that solution to precipitate manganese such that its concentration level left in solution is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter. So this pH of 10.5 and the corresponding hydroxide concentration are that critical cutoff where we've lowered the manganese concentration down to 1.8 times 10 to the negative 6 molar via precipitation of MnOH2.